All right. How's everybody doing tonight? I'm doing really good. How are you, sir? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty doing good. great, Mr. A little tired, but I'm good. No, I'm good. good. Um, small crowd tonight. Okay, who can tell me what book we're in tonight? Lamentation. Lamentation. No. Definitely not Lamentation. I wasn't here last week. So no. <laughs> I know. John. Huh? huh? John. Definitely not John. Uh, Definitely not Revelation. We're going in order. We're still in the Old Testament. Oh, back. Uh, 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 Abaha. Abaha. It's not Abakic. It is Obadiah. Obadiah. Tonight we are in the book of Obadiah. Okay? Wow. Y'all really are not paying attention. Obadiah was mentioned. I know. Well, the cheat was wrong because it said Amos on, on the... On our logo, so uh, could have left that up there. Amos was last week. This week is Obadiah, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. Obadiah is very small, so you may have a hard time finding it. Um, but just as a cheat, we're gonna we're gonna start in Genesis 25, starting in chapter and verse 19. That's where we're gonna start before we get into Obadiah. I'm gonna tell you a few things about Obadiah. First off. Um, any of you who may be fans of the Babylon Bee, does anybody know what the Babylon Bee is? Okay, okay, nice. Okay, we got we got several people who know what the Babylon Bee is. If you don't know what the Babylon Bee is, you should you should check it out because it's it's really funny. It's kind of like Christian satire. Um, and if you don't know what satire is, it's joking. It's, it's kidding around. So they went through all the books of the Bible, and Obadiah, when he got to Obadiah and, and all the other minor prophets, he said, "It's a minor prophet that is not Jonah. You can skip it." That was a joke. Ha ha ha. Um, but anyway, so if you'll notice, I have a notebook up here, right? A few weeks ago, Tim Dumas, and I'm so glad nobody else did this. So I'm so glad. Either it's not funny or I just got lucky. Tim Dumas wrote all of Daniel in his notebook. He wrote it with a pen and a notebook. So it inspired me to do the same thing. But I bet you Tim Dumas didn't get his on just one page. See, like that, and, <laughs> and part of a back page, see, like that. I wrote all of Obadiah, inspired by Tim Dumas, to do that, and um, those are all the jokes I have for tonight, so, um, sorry they weren't funny. Um, okay, so, Daniel's 12 chapters, Obadiah obviously is not that, that, that big of a book. Um, Obadiah is the shortest book in the Old Testament, it is a minor prophet, um, and I've heard it said, minor prophet, not minor in importance, minor in the fact that it's small. Um, so it's only 21 verses. And the cool thing about that is, just like a few weeks ago when Pastor Brad taught, we're going to get to go verse by verse. We're going to get to read the entirety of the book. We're going to get to talk about it um, and, 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 and sort of dig in. So, um, so shortest book in the Old Testament. Um, Obadiah, there are apparently 12 Obadiahs in the Old Testament, 12 people named Obadiah. And they're not really connected in any, in any, any specific way other than name. Obadiah itself means servant or worshiper of Yahweh. Servant or worshiper of Yahweh, that's what Obadiah means. Um, likely written around the time of the, the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon. Who remembers the year that that happened? 725. 722. No. This is the other one. Eight. Uh, nope. It's 500. Five. 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 Nope. 586. It was 586 I B.C. Said it. I said that like the... Keep your timeline. You'll have a cheat sheet at all times. There's a big pile of them somewhere. All right. So 586. It's around that time. There, there, are, there, are, a few different, there are a few different thoughts as to when it was actually written. But this, this seems to be the most likely all right, so the background of, of um, Obadiah, um, can, some of that can be found in Genesis 25. Like I said, we're going to go to Genesis 25, and we're going to read verses 19 through 34. So I'm going to need a volunteer who can read. We're going to read, a couple, we're going to read it in a few, chunk, a few different chunks. Um, I want to get somebody to read 19 through 23. Logan, read 19 through 23, Genesis 25. Oh, my God. <laughs> These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Armenian, 
Aramean, of Padam Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, if, if it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Okay, so we see here um, the, the, uh, the, the promise to Abraham. Everybody remembers the promise to Abraham. You're going you're gonna to have a lot of descendants. You're going to have a lot of people um, all the way up to Christ. Um, if you'll notice, who, who can remember when Isaac was born, what was kind of the, 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 um, the unlikely part of that? When Isaac was born, what, was, what, what made it unlikely that Isaac would ever be born? Um, this, uh, Abraham's wife was really old. Abraham and his wife were very old. They were, they were around almost 100 years old when, he, when they had it. Um, and then we see here that Isaac, their son married a woman who was barren. In other words, she couldn't have children. Um, then it, so Rebecca was barren, couldn't have children, and prayed to God for children. They, they prayed to God for children, and they had them. Um, it's, it, all, it goes back to when we talk about in Sunday school a lot of times, unlikely people that God uses to, to kind of further his promise, to, 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 to continue his the story that he, that he has planned out. So what we see here is, obviously, she got pregnant. There are two nations. There are two babies in her womb uh, fighting, apparently. Um, and we see God tell her that two nations are in her womb. Two people from within you shall be divided. One shall be stronger than the other. And the other kind of unlikely thing is the older shall serve the younger. You know, the, the oldest son in, in, in this time... Um, was the one that got the big inheritance. They were, they were held in a higher regard. So just a couple of different things there. All right, somebody read 24 through 28 for me. Genesis 25, 24 through 28. Anybody can read it. Sure, go ahead, Logan. Oh, I got to back to it, so. It's going to be a long night because we got a lot of reading to do. You said 24 through 28? Yeah, 24 through 28. Just continue what you were reading there. <laughs> when her days to give birth were completed, behold, they were twins in her womb. The first came out, out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, so they called him es his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Okay, so we see even more strife between the two brothers, right? We see them grow up, arguing, fussing, and fighting. Um, at, well, after they're, after they're born. And we're going to come back to verse 25 in a minute because it says he came out red. And that, there's some significance to that word red, okay? We're going to learn what that is here in just a few minutes. Um, his body was like a hairy cloak. We're going to see some reference to that in a later story. Um, and, uh, and again, they, 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 were, they were fussing, fighting. Esau was a skillful hunter. He was a man's man. He was an outdoorsman. Um, Jacob was not. He dwelled in tents. So he gained the favor of his father. Uh, Jacob gained the favor of his mother a little more. Um, and, and that's kind of where they're at. Um, somebody finish this out, 29 through 34. I can. All right, Amelia. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore his name was called Enoch. Jacob said, Sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what, of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Okay, so we see kind of the, the first, seemingly the first story of them is, is old, either older kids or adults. Um, with, with Jacob cooking stew, Esau comes in from a hard day's work in the field. Um, he's going to die. He feels like he's going to starve to death. And he says, give me some of that red stew. So we see he came out red. We see the red stew. 
So this, this word red apparently was a Hebrew word, ad, ad, Adom, not Adam, Adom or Edom. And that's where we see here that Esau gets his name, Edom. Okay? So, you know, there are a lot of names that get changed in Scripture. This, his name gets changed here. He was called Edom. Okay? Who remembers what Jacob is called later on? We'll get there. Israel. Very good. All right. So Jacob becomes Edom. And, um, and we know Jacob, I mean, Esau becomes Edom. Um, so what does Edom have to do with Obadiah? Well, glad you asked. So we're going to find out. But back in Genesis, um, just, a few more, just a few more things we see um, in chapter 27. We see, <clears throat> we see the story of Jacob and his mother tricking Isaac, the father, into giving the, the birthright of the oldest son to Esau. I mean, to Jacob instead of Esau. Um, we see in chapter 33... Jacob and, e Jacob and Esau actually meet and reconcile um, for a time. But there was always tension between, between the two. Um, and in verse 35, uh, chapter 35 of, of Genesis, we see Jacob renamed uh, Israel, as we talked about earlier. So we, so we have the promise to Abraham, his son Isaac and his wife, and Jacob and Esau. So Jacob equals Esau, uh, Jacob equals Israel, Esau equals Edom. I was going over this again today, and I kept messing that up. So if I get names crossed, just ignore me. Edom, Esau, Jacob, Israel. Um, so as these two were named that way, they, they had families of their own, and those families had families, and they became nations, right? So then you had the nation of Israel, you had the nation of Edom. All right? <clears throat> so because, and, and there was tension throughout the centuries, but there was still a bond because they were, they were related, okay? So they were still, they were still family, so there was still somewhat of a bond until the Babylonian attack on Jerusalem. And that bond was crushed and shattered at that point in time uh, because Israel was invaded and the people of Edom, they took advantage by plundering Israel. You know what plundering means? Anybody know what plundering means? That's what pirates do. They just like raid everything. Right? Raid everything, go in and take their stuff. Um, so there are other, there are other Old Testament books um, that kind of hold Edom accountable for this. And Obadiah is one of them. So Obadiah is basically broken down into two different sections. One larger section, verses 1 through 16, um, speak of the destruction of Edom. Talks about why they're, why they're going to be destroyed, how God's going to destroy them, what caused, this, uh, what caused all this. And then verses 17 through 21, we see the vindication of Israel and the final establishment of God's kingdom. So the main point of Edom seems to be that God's oppressed people can take courage because God is still the righteous master. God is still on his throne. Um, and he's still sovereign. All wrongs are going to be righted through, ju through judgment. And the judge, and the judge of the earth will rule openly someday with his people forever. Seems to be kind of the overarching thought here. Um, but we're going to get into the story. We're going to find out why Edom did this. What they did. And all those kinds of things. So, verse 1 of Obadiah says, the vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom, we have heard a report from the Lord, and a message has been sent among the nations. Rise up, let us rise against, rise up, let us rise against her for battle. So we see here in the very first verse, this is a vision of Obadiah, but it's the Lord's vision that he's given to Obadiah, okay? So Obadiah, in a sense, is, he's, he's, he's part of God's people, but he is essentially just the messenger here, okay? So he's the one bringing the message that God's given him. Um, and, and, but secondly, we see that this message, this is a message to Edom. Who's Edom? This is, these are the descendants of Esau, right? So that's why we did the background. That's why we kind of looked in Genesis so we could find out who, who this, these people Edom are, okay? So now we know who Edom is. We know um, that, that there's been a report that... Um, that, that they're rising up to battle against this, against this uh, Edom. Uh, so, in verses 2, who wants, who wants to read 2 through 4? Verses 2 through 4, Joseph. Okay, 
So we see Edom being called out for their, for their pride here. Um, and, and being told that he's going to humble. God's going to humble Edom. So Edom, you ever met anybody who's just snobby and thinks they're better than everybody? Okay? And that person might be you. I hope it's not. But if you've ever known that kind of person, it's really annoying. It's really not a good thing. And that was, that was where Edom was. That's where they were um, as a people. And God's calling them out for that pride. God's calling them out and he's letting them know that he's going to humble them. He's even going to embarrass them. He says he's going to make them small um, among the nations. And they're going to be utterly despised. Okay? So, uh, some pretty strong language there. And there's some significance, and we're going to get into it later when I get into kind of my five takeaways, or my, yeah, my four or five takeaways at the end. But it mentions that they soar like eagles. Have you ever, anybody ever seen an eagle in the sky? Like an, a real eagle in the sky? They kind of soar higher up than most of the other birds. I mean, they're way on up there. Um, and that's, again, where Edom thought they were. In their own minds, they were great, and they were, they were way up here. Um, he's going to bring them down, okay? Um, and the root cause of their doom is pride, which has deceived them into thinking that they soar like these eagles, out of the reach of anyone to bring them down. But God declares that, he's gonna be, that they will be brought down, and he explains how in some of the following verses. So 5 and 6. Anybody want to read 5 and 6? Amelia? If thieves came to you, if plunderers came by night, how will you have been destroyed? Would they not steal an, only enough for themselves? If great gatherers came to you, would they leave their leanings? How Esau has been pillaged, his treasure sought out. Okay. So he mentions thieves coming in and plunderers come by night. Um, and then he mentions great gatherers. So has anybody ever had a car or a house broken into? No? Nobody? Okay. Um, so if, if someone breaks into a car or a house, typically they don't take everything, okay? Typically they're going either for something that they know is there or they're going for something valuable. They're going to go in there and they're going to find the most valuable thing that they can get as a thief and they're going to steal it and they're going to leave the rest, okay? So God is kind of comparing that here um, to, to that. Um, and and they're, they're looking for the good stuff and going to leave the rest of it. The way God's going to punish Edom is they're going to have nothing left. There's going to be nothing. He mentions the grape gatherer um, who, who gathers grapes. And if you've ever gathered any crops from a garden or anything like that, you know there's some loss there. You, you go to gather it, let's just say we're gathering grapes. You're going to get the vine, you're going to drop one, you're going to step on it. You're going to leave some on the vine that you may not see. God's going to completely do away with everything. He's going to take everything from them. Uh, he's continuing to tell them how he's going to dismantle them, and he's letting them know that nothing's going to be left. And he's taking literally everything from them. Not like a thief. He's going to take everything, and it's going to be a total loss for Edom. All right. I'll take verse 7 since it's just one. It says, All your allies have driven you to, to your border. Those at peace with you have deceived you. They have prevailed against you. Those who eat your bread have set a trap beneath you. You have no understanding. So the Edomites are going to have nowhere to turn when this happens, okay? They're going to have nowhere to turn, and they have no understanding of the fact that all their former friends have been turned against them. Look back in verse 1. It says, uh, and a messenger has been sent among the nations, okay? So these are all nations, including the people that Edom thought were their friends. So, um, so God's going to turn their friends against them. Um, and... So uh, he's turning all their allies against them and because of and, and in this destruction and they're going to be ignorant to it. They're not going to see it coming. Edom, if we look at what they did to Israel when Israel was attacked, Edom, uh, we're going to see later on, what they, 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 they just stole from them. They didn't help them out. They just stood around. And what they did to Jacob was, was, was pretty low, you know, to their own brother. So it's fitting that God uses... Edom's own friends against them, to turn against them. Because Edom has turned its back on its brother, Jacob, Israel. Okay? So we're drawing the line here. Edom is Esau. Jacob is Israel. Edom has turned its back on Jacob, its brother, on Israel, its brother. So, um, all right, who wants to read 8 and 9? Verses 8 and 9. <laughs> Go ahead, Minnie. 
will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men of, out of Edom, and understanding out of, out of Mount Esau, and your mighty men shall be dismayed, O Timon? Timon? Yeah. So that every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. Okay, so basically, the synopsis of these verses is Timon, Timon is the grandson of Esau. He's a chief of Edom. Um, and Edom is wise and they're strong, okay? So they're not like just this wimpy nation that, that has, you know, has no army. They're wise and strong, but that doesn't impress God and uh, they're no match for God, okay? So that's basically, in those two verses, what, what, what we get. Um, I'll read verses 10 through 14. It says, Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall, cut, and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth, and foreigners entered his, entered his gates, and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. But do not gloat over the day of your brother in the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast in the day of distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Do not gloat over his disaster in the day of, the, of his calamity. Do not loot his wealth in the day of his calamity. Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off his fugitives. Do not hand over his survivors in the day of distress. So this is basically what Edom has done to get them to this point. We see their pride shown, uh, has shown itself during the time of Israel's deepest need and humiliation. So when the Babylonians were carrying them off to exile and they were pillaging and they were uh, doing all these horrible things, um, the, 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 the nation of Edom just stood by. It says they stood aloof. Um, they, uh, they, they did something that I think if we're all honest, we've probably done it before. Um, and this is something that uh, the commentary I use called it, you know, one of those uncomfortable type sins. But um, it's, it's the sin of being happy when you see someone else fail. Okay? That's where Edom found themselves here. Israel was being defeated. Israel was, was being carried off into exile. Okay? And Edom, their brother... Okay, their brother nation, so, so to speak, stood, stood by and allowed it to happen. But we've all fallen into this sin, I think, if we admit it. We've all been happy that someone else failed. Now, it could be an enemy that, that you didn't want to do well. It could be someone who was maybe doing the same thing that you're doing. Maybe it's basketball. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's another sport. Maybe it's soccer. Um, or, or, or any other sport, any other thing that could be called a competition. Um, you know, maybe you just didn't want them to be better than you, okay? And we have to be careful. We have to guard ourselves against that. Um, you know, we may see somebody who we, who we consider an enemy and we're happy about it uh, when they fail. Um, and we get pleasure from that sometimes. It helps us not to see our own shortcomings and it magnifies any success that we may have. Um, Edom relished in the destruction of Judah. As it says, they stood aloof, they gloated, they boasted, and they even uh, and they and they even looted. Y'all know what looting is, right? We've watched we've watched some some of that go on in our society over the last few years. When things don't go someone's way, they go in and loot stores, and they just steal all their stuff. They steal a bunch of their stuff. They um, and they destroy um, their stuff. So we see uh, Edom doing this uh, in the face of of Israel's uh, most desperate time. So Obadiah and his people knew. Now, Judah, Israel, these guys, they're not innocent, okay? They're not innocent by any means. They're suffering these things because they've sinned. They've not trusted God. If we've watched this whole story so far, from the beginning of the Bible all the way through, um, we know that God's people have not been perfect. God's people have, have been flawed. They've, they've sinned. So... They knew themselves that they were guilty, right? Edom also knew that they were guilty. And so they took, they took pleasure in this destruction. But by the same token, Israel knew Edom was guilty as well. Um, watching this, Edom should have been repentant. Edom should have seen the punishment that Israel was going through and 
been repentant and cried out for mercy, but they didn't. It should have humbled them, but it did not. Um, they gloated instead and looted and did all those things. And God reveals to Obadiah that this sin is not going to go unpunished. Okay? Um, the, the, the nation of Edom will pay for this. Um, anybody want to read verses 15 and 16? Okay. okay. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. For as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations shall drink continually. They shall drink and swallow, and shall be as though they had never been. Okay. So we see sort of a look into the future, the day of the Lord um, coming. It says that it is coming, uh, or is it is upon all the nations. Um, I messed that up. My bad. <laughs> it is upon all the nations. Um, and, then he, and then he goes on to tell them, as you've done, it's going to be done back to you. The, you you're going to reap what you sow. Um, so one of the commentaries I read kind of talked about the timing of this, the near future and the distant future sort of merging. And, you know, while we can camp out on that, what we need to, what we need to understand is it's much like, it's much like um, eschatology. Anybody remember what eschatology is? Any students? The study, study of, of end times. times. The study of end times. Very good. It's the study of end times. So there's a lot of emphasis on when things are going to happen. Okay? And those are good conversations to have. We need to have them. We need to learn. We need to study those things. I know I need to study them because I don't fully understand them. Um, but the important thing is that it's going to happen. Okay? So in this case, it's not, the, it's not you know, the return of Jesus like we talk about in eschatology, but God's justice is going to be achieved against Edom. And that's the that. That's the thing that's going to happen. This violent nation who thinks they've done no wrong and they think that they're going to boast forever, very soon the payment's going to be due. Very soon it's going to come a time where they have to pay for what they've done here. Um, and then after that, all nations will give account to God. And that's the conclusion of the first part of the book, The Destruction of Edom. Okay, so we've seen some kind of strong language. We've seen why Edom is in the position that they're in and what's going to happen to them because of that. Okay, the second part was, um, was the vindication and, uh, of God's people. So, verses 17 through 21, I'll go ahead and read that. It says, But in Mount Zion there shall be those who escape, and it shall be holy. And the house of Jacob shall possess their own possessions. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. In the house of Esau, stubble. They shall burn, they shall burn them and consume them, and there shall, not, there shall be no survivor for the, house of Esau, for the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Those of the Negev shall possess Mount Esau, and those of the Shephelah, Shephelah shall possess the land of the Philistines. They shall possess the land of Ephraim and the land of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. The exiles of this host of the people of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites as far as Zarephath. And the exiles of Ju Jerusalem who are in Sh uh, Shepharad shall possess the cities of Negev. Sa uh, Saviors shall go up to the mountain, mount of Zi to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. So we see a do uh, uh, I do well. Obadiah assures, his, assures the people of Judah that on the Lord's day there's going to be hope for those in Zion. Okay? Since Judah had been driven into exile for its unbelief, and since judgment was coming upon Edom and the nations because of their pride and violence, we have to assume the people who escape God's judgment are those who are humble and trust God in His mercy. Okay? We're going to get into this a little bit more in just a second in one of the takeaways. So, um, so just kind of remember, remember this. Um, the second part of the book holds out the hope for salvation for the remnant of Israel and the promises that in the end of the kingdom, uh, that in the end the kingdom will not belong to the Babylonians nor to the Edomites, but to the Lord. Okay? Promises made long ago to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we hear that a lot, right? A Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And again, we're going to get into that a little bit more. Um, that their descendants would possess the land will not be frustrated, it will not be thwarted. This is God's plan. In Sunday school, we're talking about God's plan. Um, as many unlikely people, as many unlikely scenarios, it's not going to be thwarted. Um, 
And in the New Testament, we see how much larger this fulfillment will be than what is seen here. So here we've got a picture of what's to come, okay? And it's a smaller picture, but it's still, it's still a good picture of what is to come. So we see um, the people that he's talking about are the people of Israel, right? That's much more expansive in the New Testament. Galatians 3, 28 through 29 talks about there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither male nor female. All nations, all types of people um, are going to be saved. Not only, uh, not only the Jews. Paul says in Romans 4.13 that the descendants of Abraham will inherit the world, not just the territory. So in these last verses, we see just some specific places that they inherit. But moving further along, they're going to inherit the world. Matthew 5.5 5 says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Not just a small, um, not just a small part of it. Um, and then Psalm 22.28 uh, through 29 says the kingdom belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. So he doesn't rule just over part of it. He doesn't rule just over earth. He rules over everything. Okay? Um, so repentant Christ honoring Israel will have her land but it will only be a small province in the kingdom of the Lord. And like all other province, provinces it will be freely shared with the people from every tribe, tongue, and nation and to those, or to those who are followers of Christ. Okay? So from this book I've got five takeaways, and then I've got something I want to end on, something that y'all have probably heard before. So takeaway number one is God rules the world, rules in the world right now and turns the course of nations and history as he pleases. If this wasn't true, he couldn't promise Judah that he would cut off Edom and establish Jacob, okay? No Christian, so we, we live in a world of sin, right? We look at this world and we go, man, this world's messed up, all right? And we would be correct, right? The world is very messed up. But we don't have to, we don't have to be afraid of that. Um, as, as the commentary put, we don't have to be like, we don't have to feel like kids in the back of a station wagon back in the 80s. Now only the adults in here may get that because we didn't wear seat belts when we were kids. We just bounced around the car most of the time. I probably shouldn't say that, but that's what we did. Uh, and we survived it. But God is in control. We don't have to feel that way. We don't have to feel um, dismayed when we look around at the world. The second takeaway is pride is deceptive. Pride is very deceptive. Verse 3 said, The pride of your heart has deceived you. Who knows what it means to be deceived? Fooled. Trick. Huh? Fooled. Fooled, Trick. tricked, yeah. Been, be given a lie and made to believe it. Okay? Um, so, so pride is, is that. Pride is, is, decept, is deceptive. Um, it makes us think we're independent, self-sufficient, uh, Pride is a liar because we are absolutely not independent and self-sufficient. Self Pride destroys every area of thought and life. And I think if we're being honest, I've heard Tim say this before, Pastor Tim, um, at, the, at the root of all sin, I believe, is pride. At the root of all sin, I believe, is pride. Okay? Um, and there are many examples of that um, in, in, in sins that we commit on a daily basis. Um, so pride is something we need to guard ourselves against. It, it's a deceiver. It's a liar. Okay? And we need to guard ourselves against it. And, and I mean that as encouragement. We, do, we, we need to check ourselves when it comes to that. Um, the next thing along those lines is pride um, is going to be punished and it's going to be bad. Um, back, to the, the verse, uh, back to verse 4 where it says, Though you soar aloft like the eagle... Though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Um, <clears throat> like we talked about the eagles, they fly super high up in the air. In, in the air. They fly above, I think, any other bird. I didn't look up the science on this. but um, I actually have a video on my phone <clears throat> of two eagles flying around like my backyard. And you can barely see them in the video, but you can hear them. Uh, and, and it's just interesting that these people, that's where they thought they were. Like I said earlier, that's where they thought they were. And as we all know, the higher you are, the harder you fall, right? When you fall, it's, it's harder. It hurts worse. So that's, um, that's what God's promised them. And he's going to let them fall from that. He's going to let them fall from that height, from that height that they think that they're at. Um, uh, fourth takeaway, proud people and nations will reap what they sow. Uh, verse 15 says, as you've done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return to your own head. 
If our pride is something that leads us to live without God, He will grant us that independence often. Okay? Who understands that? He'll grant us that independence. He'll give us what we want. Is there anywhere else in Scripture that you see that example? Of God giving people over. Romans 1. Romans 1, 24 through 32, we see Paul talking about God giving people over to the lust of the flesh, to the things that they think that they want. And he gave them over in Romans um, to what they thought they want, to their, own, to their own demise. See, Edom lived a good earthly life. Edom had lots of things. Edom was allowed to stand by and watch Israel go through their punishment for their sin. Not only that, they were allowed to go in and plunder and loot and do all the things that they did. They were allowed these things. And it sort of looked like they weren't being punished for it. Anybody know a quote-unquote bad person who seems to have it all here on the earth? Here on earth? You know, we've talked about celebrities who have committed suicide and things like that because the things of this world were not enough. Right? So, um, so we see that... Um, and the last takeaway, um, and this is, this is where we're going to get kind of our gospel Jesus connection, okay, um, in the book of Obadiah. Um, in verse 17 it says, But in Mount Zion there shall be those who escape, and it shall be holy. Okay? There's an escape. All right? There's an escape, and there's salvation from God's wrath. God made that way through Jesus. <clears throat> is it good for God to punish sin? Your head up and down. Yes. Is it good for God to forgive sin? Yes. It is good for God to forgive. If he, apart from doing either one of these things, he's not holy and he ceases to be God. He does these things. Um, and, and again, this is where we find the gospel. Those who by grace have, have fled from the wickedness of pride and humility and holiness and, and to holiness, to humility and holiness, will find refuge on the day, on the day of the Lord. Zion, the city of God, shall be holy because it, was, it will be filled not with those who never sinned, but those who have been broken and humbled by their sin. Okay? So, the last thing I want us to go over um, has to do with Jacob and Esau, and I haven't, I don't think we've, we've covered this um, yet in our studies. But, we see later on in the Bible, in Romans 9, we see this sentence that often bothers people. Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Okay? So that's God speaking. All right? <clears throat> Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. What do you think that the world likes to pull from that? Which part? Jacob I have loved or Esau I have hated? Esau I have hated. That's, a, that's an easy one for the unbelieving world. Where you, if there is a God, he's hating. He doesn't love. Right? There's a saying, I think, I want to say James White said it. I know he's requoted it, but it goes something like this The wonder of Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated, is not Esau I have hated. It's Jacob I have loved. Okay? And what do I mean by that? Well, Jacob, just like you and I, is a sinner. Okay? We watched, we, we talked about back in Genesis what Jacob did, some of the things that Jacob did. He. Fooled his father into getting the, the older brother's inheritance. He put on, like he literally put on a coat so that he would feel hairy, so that his father would feel it, because his father was going blind because he was old. So that his father would feel it and think he was Esau, give him the inheritance. He sold, he, he bought his brother's birthright for a bowl of soup, okay? Um, so we, we, see, we see too many times people camp out on Esau I've hated, and where, when, they should, when they should camp out on Jacob I've loved. Um, they say things like, I can't believe God said he hated Esau. He's God. He's love. But we fail to be in awe that Jacob I've loved. So like David and Paul, like Joe, like Keith, like Brad, like me, the list goes on. Jacob sinned. He's, like I said, he deceived his father. Um, he bought his brother's earth, birthright. Um, but he was chosen by God. Um, and we shouldn't be near as obsessed about Esau as we are about what happened for Jacob. Um, with God loving him. Um, again, in many circles, we hear people say a loving God wouldn't send anyone to hell, right? Yeah, and many of y'all have heard that. A loving God wouldn't send anyone to hell. 
The truth is, you're headed to hell. Period. Apart from the grace of God. So, we're already headed there, but the fact that God saves even one person shows His love and mercy and grace. Through His Son Jesus, He made a way. He made an escape, like we talked about there in Obadiah. That escape is Jesus Christ. Okay? He made an escape, and that, folks, is the miracle. That is what should have us in awe. That He saved somebody like me. That He saved somebody like you if you're saved in here. That's what should have us excited. That's what should have us in awe at all times. I don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. And Jacob certainly did not deserve it. But we have it through Christ. And that should cause us to be in constant awe. And that's what I've got. I'm going to pray for us. And we'll be done. <clears throat> Dear God, we just thank you for this time that we've had. We thank you for your word. Um, thank you for this small book of Obadiah and uh, what it means. We thank you for that escape that is Jesus Christ. And um, we thank you for loving sinners like us um, and seeing Christ's righteousness rather than that sin when you look upon us. God, we ask, I ask that uh, anything that I've said here tonight that may be misunderstood, anything that I didn't um, convey clearly would be cleared up to these students. And um, Lord, just pray that, uh, that you would be with them and that they would grow from this lesson and learn from it. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.